looking at a question, a uh, retrosynthetic question, starting with ethane and getting that to go to acetylene and alkyne. Right, so we want to think about retrosynthetic analysis here. First thing we want to ask ourselves is do we have any more carbons? Do we add carbons here? So we didn't add any carbons, but what did we add? We added two pi bonds, right, two of them. So you guys only know one way to make a pi bond. Well, no, that's not. Well, how do you, what is the, what kind of reactions make pi bonds? Eliminations. And if you have two of them, you need to do two eliminations. So one step back from here, you're going to need to have, all right, two leaving groups. So two bromines on there, right? Now, if you wanted to add two bromines, what star material would that have came from? Alkene. Good. If you want to make an alkene, how many leaving groups do you need? One. If you want to add a bromine to an alkene, right, usually you would add it to the most substituted card, but in this case it doesn't matter, right? You can do that, right? So now going forward, right, what, do you, what reagents do you need to add a, a single bromine to break a CH bond? That's that Br2 and that light. Very good. I want to do an elimination. What am I going to, what, what am I going to need here? To do an elimination? Just, um, OH minus. Not OH minus, right? OH minus could do an SN2. This is still a primary alkyl halide. I need a big bulky base, right? We're gonna need that. Yep. So yeah, we could use we could use NH two minus as well. That would work. But a big bulky base is probably better here. If I want to add two bromines, what do I use? Br2. Just Br two. Remember, no light. Be careful with that. Right? No light. And then if I want to do an elimination of the two bromines, i will get two equivalences of NaNH two would work. You could also set two big bulky bases. That've been fine too. Right. Either way, you need a strong base. You need to do two eliminations. So let's look at um, an electrophilic aromatic substitution and activators versus deactivators, right? So this is EAS. So of course, in electrophilic aromatic substitution, the benzene ring is always the nucleophile. And part of what you have to do with these is differentiate the substituents and see what they are. Are they activators or deactivators? And then which way do they direct? The confusing ones... Right? So there's either activate the ring, you either make the ring more electronegative, you either give electrons to the ring, make it more nucleophilic, or you deactivate and take away electrons. Now, all activators, all activators, if you donate electrons, right, are ortho paradirectors. Deactivators, for the most part, direct meta, right? But they're bad, right? They're deactivating the ring. The ones that are tough are the X's, right? Halogens, right? So things like fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they are deactivating the ring, right? They take away electrons from the ring. They're electronegative, right? They're electronegative, but they direct ortho and para because they still donate a lone pair. So they're overall, they're deactivators, but they direct ortho and para. So they have the ability for resonance. If you can do lone pair resonance, you're going to go ortho, you're going to direct ortho and para. Right? How you direct has nothing to do with whether you're an activator or deactivator, technically. Right? Being an activator or deactivator is, is asking overall, am I giving electrons to the ring or taking them away? So, right? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine can do resonance, but overall, their effect is to take away electron density. Whereas the other ones do not. And then the other big question you got to say, so okay, now I know I have a fluorine and I have a methyl. And methyls are activators by hy via hyperconjugation and fluorine is a deactivator. So the question is, what's more important for where things are going to go? An activator or a deactivator? So who, who should I look towards to decide where if I have an electrophile, E+, plus, what's more, who's more important, an activator or a deactivator for deciding where to go? Activators. activators. Right, activators matter more. So in this case, if I numbered these carbons, one, two, three, four, right? Obviously I can't replace fluorine. 
what carbons would you expect E plus E to end up on? Which carbons? One and three would be the ones, right? Because they're the ones that are ortho and para to the activator methyl. Um, I'm going to revisit number 63 from the 1998 ACS exam. So basically saying what's going on with an anionic polymerization. So an anionic polymerization, what's going on in an anionic polymerization? Um, essentially that means anionic, right? So there's going to be negative charges, and polymerization means a lot of these monomers are going to come together. So we need to start with a negative charge, right? And a lot of times... Polymerization, polymerizations are started with an initiator, which we learned a little bit about. So we'd have to have an initiator with a negative charge to get this started, right? We can't create charge. So they show us four molecules, and they want to know which of these will readily undergo anionic polymerization. One way of thinking about this is which one of these would be completely happy with getting a negative charge? Not starting with a negative charge, but getting a negative charge. So that's an I minus, initiator minus, whatever. Same deal. So A, let's look at A. A is a styrene B is an alpha beta unsaturated ester so there's an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ester C is just an alkene and then D is this kind of enol looking thing um, so basically the way to think about this is which of these, right, so first they're going to react with initiate with a negative charge because this is, again, anionic polymerization, right? If it was cationic polymerization, the first monomer would have to be the nucleophile, right? But in this case, it's going to be the electrophile because of anionic. It's going to create an anion. So where would the negative charge attack each of these, right? For easy things to think about, these have to be electrophiles. Have you guys ever seen an alkene be an electrophile? No, it's always been a nucleophile, so let's get rid of that. What about this alkene with an oxygen on? That's even more, like, more nucleophilic alkene, so again, no. Right? That leaves the styrene, the alkene, and this. Have you, again, have you ever seen this be an electrophile, an alkene with that? No. So it has to be B, right? Because B has spots where it's electrophilic. That's the key. So that means it can stabilize a negative charge. And really what happens is this attacks beta, and you end up with a negative charge on that alpha carbon, and that continues to react over and over again, and that's how it reacts. But anionic polymerization means it can stabilize, the first monomer can stabilize a negative charge. So that means it has to be the electrophile. The initiator is a nucleophile. If it was cationic, it would be just the opposite. Cationic means, right, in that case, this would probably be the best, right, if it was cationic polymerization, then this would probably be the best monomer. Right, because this is the one that has the best nucleophile, right? Electrons coming down, attacking. But if it's anionic, you want an electrophile. So doing number 11 from exam 4, 2015. So our retrosynthetic problem. So one of the tricks here, not a trick, but one of the things ideally you would have done is simply ignored all the OHs because they are just along for the ride. And at the end of the day, they don't matter at all. Those, these three OHs have nothing to do. They're all right here, right? So one of the first things you should have done was, right, ask yourself, are there any new carbons? We're not, we're not really making any new carbon-carbon bonds, right? We've lost some carbons, right, here. But we're not making any new carbons, right? Carbon-carbon bonds are adding new carbons. So you, one of the things you should do, of course, is then number your carbons. Right? One, two, three, four, five. Now, this molecule is symmetrical, right? So you could look and say, well, one, two, three, four, five. So we number our carbons, right? One, two, there they are, right? 
So that should really help us. So what bond did we really have to make first, right? If we look at this and we say, right, retrosynthetically going backwards, what's our most polar bond here? One to oxygen, right? You should really think about breaking that, right? Because, right, that one, carbon one has an oxygen bond to it, right? So that's a delta plus site. And then the oxygen obviously is electronegative, right? And that, that bond wasn't, that didn't exist here, right? This OH to carbon two was there, O to three, O to three was there, O to four, right? All these three bonds exist in the starting material. Those aren't new bonds, right? So the trick here really was to number your carbons, right? So if you look at this, what is this, right? This carbon has two bonds to oxygen. So it really was an aldehyde. And this was an OH. Right, we did this problem. We went over sugar chemistry. I just left out these other oxygens. We went over the exact same problem almost in class. Right, we said, oh, look, it, you could have this as that hemiacetal or acetal conformation. Right, so from here, right, you also should have thought, well, wait a second. This molecule is symmetrical, it has two esters, and at the end of the day, I don't have two esters. So I must need to do something to differentiate these two, and that should make you think about protecting groups. Right? All I need to do with protecting groups, I might need to make one, something different along the way. So right here, you say, well, I have an ester and an alcohol, but there's no way right, I could have got these in one step. So maybe I should have protected this, this aldehyde, not ester, not ester, aldehyde. So to protect it, Right, you'd put it. I'll put a mask on it. So now that it has the mask, right, you could have done more rea different reactions with that alcohol, right? Number our carbons again: one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Five. Right, so now I can do something with carbon five, right, that I normally wouldn't be able to do because we've masked carbon one. Right. Over here. Well, if I go one step back, right, that's a primary alcohol. Can I turn an ester into a primary alcohol? Yeah. So while this guy was masked, right, I can do the, the different chemistry over here. So this could have been an ester still. All right. And now if I take the mask off, this would be back to being an aldehyde. And then the question is, do you know how to turn an ester into an aldehyde? Who knows what that one does? That was the, the, one of the tricky ones. So this could have came from, which was the starting material. Wait, what part do we lose our carbons to the final product? Just for the... So you don't lose any carbon. So now we'll go forward, right? So you don't actually lose, you lose the meth, you, you lose these, right? So let's go forward now. What reagent would work to turn one of those into an aldehyde. What's the reducing agent that changes an ester to an aldehyde? Dibol. Remember Dibol H? That is one way to stop it because it was sterically bulky. You could have said a sterically bulky reducing agent, say, I need to stop it at aldehyde. If you want to put a mask on, right, you'd have H plus. You could just say, I want one equivalent. You could say that. One equivalent. If it wasn't dibol, it turned into an alcohol? If it wasn't dibol, yeah, it would take it all the way down to, well, if it was, has to be dibol. If you use lithium aluminum hydride, it would take it to an alcohol. If you used NADH4, it wouldn't do anything. Okay. Right, so then we put our mask on now, right? So now the step where you're just asking, how do I reduce? Now I need to use lithium aluminum hydride, right? That's step one, and then step two is the H plus. Right, and that will reduce this to a alcohol. Do we use dibol ever? 
Yeah. You had to use it here. Did we, I mean, did we use it in work? Yeah, we talked about it. I mean, like, in the lab. Oh, we never use it in lab, no. Is it? No, it's, it's kind of a special reagent that, right, turns an ester into an aldehyde, like, and it, you know, so you don't, right, so it's, it's pretty unique, yeah, you don't really do that, yeah. Can you use it again? So now let's talk about, so now we need to reduce it, reduce the other one. Now we need to take this off, the mask off, and that's just going to be H plus and a whole lot of water, right? And then to get this to cyclize, you just would add H plus as a catalyst, right? Because H plus would protonate the ester, or the aldehyde here, excuse me. This would attack tetrahedral intermediate, regenerate the catalyst. You're at the hemiacetone. Yeah, I... I in theory, if people had numbered the carbons, that would have been that would have really helped. I didn't mean for these other OHs to get to become confusing. In retrospect, I would have I should have numbered all the carbons for you ahead of time and said, "Here you go." Use again, or use nope, because dibol again would only make it go to the aldehyde. You'd have to keep you you want this to be the alcohol, right? You need that to be the alcohol. So you need to use a strong reducing agent, reactive reducing agent. 